This is the IELTS listening test. You will hear a number of different recordings and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four parts. At the end of the test, you will be given 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet. Now turn to part one. The test is in four part, part one, part two, part three, and part four. Now look at part one. Part one. You will hear Joanne describing her home city of Darwin in Australia to a man called Rob who hopes to go there. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 5. Joanne? Hi! You must be Rob. Nice to meet you. So, I hear you're planning to visit Australia. Yeah, and I really wanted to talk to you because I was thinking of spending some time in Darwin and my sister told me you're from there. That's right. So, tell me about it. Well, where shall I start? Well, Darwin's in what they call the top end because it's right up at the northern end of Australia and it's quite different from the rest of Australia in terms of cultural influences. In fact, it's nearer to Jakarta in Indonesia than it is to Sydney, so you get a very strong Asian influence there. That means we get lots of tourists. People from other parts of Australia are attracted by this sort of international cosmopolitan image. And as well as that, we've got the same laid-back atmosphere you get all over Australia, probably more so, if anything, because of the climate. But what a lot of the tourists don't realise until they get there is that the city's also got a very young population the average age is just 29, and this makes the whole place very buzzy. Some people think that there might not be that much going on as far as art and music and dancing and so on are concerned because it's so remote. I mean, we don't really get things like theatre and opera in the same way as cities down in the south like Sydney, for example, because of the transport expenses. But in fact, what happens is that we just do it ourselves Lots of people play music, classical as well as pop, and there are things like artists' groups and writers' groups and dance classes. Everyone does something. We don't just sit and watch other people. You said it's very international? Yeah, they say there's over 70 different nationalities in Darwin. For instance, there's been a Chinese population there for over 100 years. We've even got a Chinese temple. It was built way back in 1887, but um, when a very bad storm, a, a cyclone in fact, hit Darwin in the 1970s, it was almost completely destroyed. The only parts of the temple that survived were part of the altars and the stone lions, but after the storm they reconstructed it using modern materials. It's still used as a religious centre today, but it's open to tourists too, and it's definitely worth going to see it. Oh, and as far as getting around goes, you'll see places that advertise bicycles for hire, but I wouldn't recommend it. A lot of the year it's just so hot and humid. Some tourists think it'll be fine because there's not much in the way of hills and the traffic's quite light compared with some places, but believe me, you're better off with public transport. It's fine and not expensive. Or you can hire a car, but it's not really worth it. What's the swimming like? Well, there are some good beaches, but the trouble is that there's this nasty creature called the box jellyfish, and if it stings you, you're in bad trouble. 
So you have to be very careful most of the year, especially in the winter months. You can wear a lycra suit to cover your arms and legs, but I wouldn't like to risk it even so, personally. And there are the saltwater crocodiles too. I mean, I don't want to put you off. There are protected swimming areas netted off where you'll be safe from jellyfish and crocs, or there are the public swimming pools. They're fine, of course. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. So which places would you specially recommend? Well, one of the most popular attractions is called Aquacene. What happens is every day at high tide, hundreds of fish come in from the sea, all different sorts, including some really big deep sea fish. And some of them will even take food from your hand. It's right in the middle of town at the end of the Esplanade. It's not free. I think you have to pay about $5. But it's definitely something you have to experience. Then, of course, Darwin has a great range of food. Being such a cosmopolitan place, and if you don't have lots to spend, the best place to go is to Smith Street Mall, where they have stalls selling stuff to eat. There's all sorts of different things, including Southeast Asian dishes, which I really like. You'd think there'd be plenty of fresh fish in Darwin, as it's on the coast, but in fact, because of the climate, it mostly gets frozen straight away. But you can get fresh fish in the restaurants on Cullen Bay Marina. It's a nice place to go for a special meal, and they have some good shops in that area too. What else? Well, there's the Botanic Garden... It's over 100 years old and there's lots to see. An orchid farm, rainforest, a collection of palm trees, uh, a wetlands area. You can easily spend an afternoon there. That's at Fanny Bay, a couple of kilometres out to the north. Then if you've got any energy left in the evening, the place to go is Mitchell Street. That's where it all happens as far as clubs and music and things are concerned. You'll bump into lots of my friends there. Talking of friends, why don't I give you some email addresses? I'm sure they wouldn't mind. If you... That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a speech given by the head of a company to some new employees. You have 30 seconds to look at questions 11 to 16. First of all, a warm welcome to Barker's Country Safaris. We're delighted to have you all on board for this season. I know you've all been told a bit about the company when you had your job interview, but I thought it would be worth telling you a bit more about ourselves. Barker's was set up 10 years ago by myself, John, and my then girlfriend and now wife, Nancy. We started it initially just as a hobby, 
We felt that there was a good opportunity to share our love of the countryside in this part of the world with the many visitors who come here. As you know, most people come for the beaches in the summer, but there is so much more to the region, and this is what we wanted to exploit. Nancy and I were born near here, and as teenagers, we went climbing, kayaking, white water rafting, potholing, and just straightforward walking. This district is in our blood, and we love it. <laughs> While we were still at university, we started taking small groups of visitors out into the National Park in Nancy's brother's old Land Rover. We'd drive them around the back lanes and into the forest. We'd also organise rock climbing tours for friends of friends. Then, each year, without us having to advertise, people came back to us to ask for more excursions and trips. So, five years ago, we gave up our other jobs to focus full-time on Barker's Country Safaris. Now, two years after that, we set up the activity tour part of the business, and one year ago, we expanded into organising activities for school groups during term time. Obviously, this was a massive challenge with all the health and safety requirements, but it's proving a great success. You now have 30 seconds to look at questions 17 to 20. You now have 30 seconds to look at questions 17 to 20. Anyway, we'll certainly not be dealing with school parties during the summer holidays. Our clients for the next three months are mostly family parties or groups of friends, and I'd like to talk a bit now about the tours we offer and what your responsibilities will be. Our most popular excursion is the Woodland Tour and Trail. Now, often this is sold out and we have all of our 10 Jeeps and convoy with eight people in each Jeep. It's a lot of fun. These tours really offer a taster of what we can provide. So as both driver and guide, it is important that you do a good job here so they come back for the bigger tours. Uh, I will talk about the commission package later. As the summer days are so long, we have three tours each day, but you will not be expected to work on more than two of them. Morning tours start at 8am and go to midday. Afternoon tours are from 2pm to 6pm, and then evening ones, 7pm to 11pm. All the tours follow the same route, and you should have made yourselves familiar with all the key information. This was provided to you in the information pack you were sent when you accepted the job offer. This is important, so if you haven't had time yet, please do so now. Our second most popular tour is the Family Exclusive. Now, this tour is for the whole day and for only one group. Usually it is just one jeep, but sometimes there are two if the party is large. These tours go from 10am till 5pm and include lunch at the Brown Bear in Lower Middleton. We have a number of different routes for these tours as we don't want our premium clients being made to feel that they are part of a large package deal. Uh, you will be told which route to take with your weekly schedule. Now, I'd like to move on to the specialty tour packages. These are the ones that we are keen to book people on once they've done the woodland tour and trail trip. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now it turns to part three. Part three. And welcome to this morning's lecture on transport. First, you have some time to look at questions twenty-one to twenty-five. Now listen carefully and answer questions twenty-one to twenty-five. Good morning, and welcome to this morning's lecture on transport. What I'll be doing today is comparing forms of transport in different countries to see how forms of transport are affected by factors such as geographical landscape and economic development. My focus will be on countries in South America, Europe, and Asia. The first country I'd like to look at is Colombia, which is in South America. This is a country where geography plays an important role. Due to the huge amount of mountains and forests in this country, travelling by air is crucial. I don't know if many of you realise this fact, but Colombia was the first country to establish a commercial airline, and in so doing, they made aviation history. Today. There are more than 400 airports in Colombia for domestic flights, which highlights the point I made earlier that air travel is a vital means of transport in this country. Colombia also has a road network of about 48,000 kilometers, linking Colombia to Venezuela and Ecuador. Transport by road is important for trade as well as tourism. Apart from this, there is also a railway system, but it is in need of modernization. The other means of transport is by steamers, with the Magdalena being the main waterway. Now let's turn to Colombia's neighbour, Venezuela. Once again, we see that internal flights are an important means of transport, as, like Colombia, Venezuela has remote areas where flying is the easiest means of travelling from A to B. Trains are not popular, and most of the railway lines are in the highlands, as this is where the iron ore mines are. Trains are an efficient means of transporting the iron ore from the mines to the factories. Thus, we can see how transport and the economy are interrelated. Ships are also used extensively in this country, and there are many ports. The main seaports being Puerto Cabello and Guanta. Turning now to Europe, Belgium is a country that boasts one of the most compact railway systems worldwide. Inland waterways or canals are also an important means of transport, transporting both freight and people. Belgium also has the third largest seaport in the world, namely Antwerp. Air travel is also important, although this is not linked to geographical terrain, as is the case in the South American countries we've already looked at. Next, I'd like to look at the United Kingdom, like Belgium. The UK has inland waterways around 4,000 kilometres, yet only about 17% of these are used for commercial transport. The main inland port is Manchester, and the chief seaport is London, with Southampton taking second place. Air travel is extensive in this country, and there are around 150 airports, the most famous being Heathrow. However, about 90% of passengers in the UK travel by road. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions twenty-six to thirty. Now listen and answer questions twenty-six to thirty. Finally, I'd like to look at two Asian countries. China is a country which reveals how geographical size affects transport development. 
roads and railways are widely used, and this has led to a huge amount of bridges being built, such as the Yangtze Bridge, which is probably the most widely known. The Yangtze Bridge is 1.6 kilometers long and is built on two levels. The upper tier is for cars and pedestrians, while the lower is for trains. Railways are especially important, and over 80 percent of freight and passengers are transported by rail. With such a high proportion of people using trains, it is not surprising that governments in countries like China are prepared to invest in the railway system. Obviously, a fast and effective train service will encourage businesses and the general public to continue using it. The last country I'm going to mention is Japan, which has one of the most advanced transport systems in the world. The railway system is highly developed, and the Takedo Railway. Connecting Tokyo and Osaka has trains that can travel up to 250 kilometers per hour. Ships are also a vital means of transport in both international and domestic areas. To summarize, we can see that transport varies throughout the world, yet the importance of transport networks, be they air, sea, rail, or road, cannot be underestimated. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You are going to hear a lecture about the geographic information about Australia. You now have some time to read questions thirty-one to forty. Now listen to the lecture and answer questions thirty-one to forty by choosing the best answers from the choices. Good morning, everybody. We'll continue to look at Australia, and today look at one of its greatest natural challenges: water for the agricultural sector. As the only nation to occupy an entire continent, Australia has a unique environment. With much of it very flat and dry, one notable feature of the Australian continent is that it is the lowest of the continents. The average elevation is less than three hundred meters, compared with the world's mean of seven hundred meters, and its highest mountain is only two thousand two hundred and twenty-eight meters. So, it is overall a very flat country. It is also dry. In fact, Australia is the driest, after Antarctica, of the continents. Yet Australia has extremes of climate and topography. There are rainforests and vast plains in the north, snowfields in the southeast, deserts in the centre, and fertile croplands in the east, south, and southwest. And Australia contains some of the wettest areas on Earth. In western Tasmania, and on the northern Queensland coast, but half of the continent has an annual rainfall of less than three hundred millimeters each year, and only twenty percent has more than six hundred millimeters each year. A major problem is that the limited water resources do not match up with where water is consumed. The major water resources are in northern Australia and Tasmania, whereas most of the agriculture 
and people are in southeastern mainland Australia. The agricultural sector is the largest consumer of both self-extracted and main supplied water, using over 70% of total net water consumption. Electricity and gas supply and water, sewerage and drainage services use notable amounts of self-extracted water. However, net consumption in the household sector is the lowest, just 8% of total net water used. Australia's water use increased by 25% over the decade between the mid-1980s and mid-1990s. Much of this increase was due to irrigated agriculture, which, as noted earlier, accounts for over 70% of national water demand. Since the mid-1990s, the growth and profitability of irrigated agriculture has outstripped the dryland agriculture sector. Irrigated commodities contributed almost a third of total farm exports in the mid-1990s. The results of a special government report in 2000 showed that if today's water use arrangements continue, the water needs of the rural industries will outstrip water availability by about 2020. Irrigated agriculture, Australia's major water using sector, would be seriously affected by the shortwall. And although groundwater underlies large areas of Australia, it accounts for only 4% of water use. So, clearly, apart from water for households, which mainly comes from dams or rivers, it is the rural sector where efforts towards water conservation are particularly directed. In this sector, the largest consumers of water are the meat and wool industries. One of the major problems in considering sustainable agriculture is the large amount of irrigated water used to produce these products. Some of the crops, such as wheat, maize and soybeans, also use a lot of water. Furthermore, Many crops are grown in dry areas, where up to half the available water evaporates from the soil surface or seeps down too low into the ground for the plant roots to reach it. Well, that's all we have time for this morning. You will be able to do further study on this topic in the library, and I have a handout here with references for those who want to come out to the front to collect it. Next week, we'll look at outback farming and... That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.